<laughs> is this gonna be another one that's really hard to tell? Wow. Yeah, you fooled me. You fooled me. My name is Vince Anner, and I'm a certified sommelier, and today I'm gonna be trying cheap versus expensive wines and seeing if I can tell the difference. Today we're talking about price in wine. I'm gonna be doing a blind tasting challenge and guessing which one of the wines is cheaper versus which one's more expensive. My lovely wife has helped conceal six bottles back there, two different bottles of a few different types. So a sparkling, a white, and a red wine. And I'm gonna also talk about the three factors that make wine more affordable versus more expensive in the first place. And then at the end of the video, I'm gonna tell you where I think the sweet spot is for how much you should actually spend on a bottle of wine. So stick around for that. Before we get started, please, if you have a moment, hit the subscribe button so you can see more challenges, reviews, and wine videos. Let's get into it. In my opinion, there's three main factors that determine the price of a wine. And it's not just based on the quality of the grapes. And it's either a good thing or a bad thing, depending how you look at it. It means there's wines out there that you'll overpay for because of reasons I'm gonna get into, but that also means that there's wines that are undervalued. You can find good values in wine too. So the first reason I would say that a wine is more expensive or less expensive is the place it comes from. And there's a few factors within this. So there's the reputation of the region. So your Napas, your Bordeaux, your Burgundies, your Champagnes, these have a name attached to them, just like a brand name, like Apple or something like that. And so you're gonna pay a little bit more just because they can charge a bit more. Uh, and then you also have the cost of grapes within that. The land in those places tend to be more expensive, so your cost of grapes are gonna be more expensive. The other thing are taxes, export, and distribution costs. So I used to live in California. I always thought it was weird that you'd go into a grocery store, and a lot of times the European wines would be cheaper than the Californian wines that you're getting right up the road. But Europe does a really good job of subsidizing their wine industry, whereas California uh, has a lot of taxes imposed on each level of the wine distribution, and so it's kind of opposite. And on the flip side, if you remember a few years ago, there was all these tariffs being talked about, about European goods coming in. So the taxes and the export fees and all that are definitely gonna play into it. And then the last thing is labor costs, which differ from place to place. So places like South America have lower labor costs than places like America and some places in Europe. And so you're gonna end up with that affecting the final wine cost as well. Okay, so before I get into the next two reasons about how price and wine relate, let's do the first of the three tastings. So here's what happened. I gave my wife a list of guidelines and rules. She went out and picked bottles that make sense for the kind of this comparison. I'm gonna go off camera. You're not gonna see any of this. We'll cut. Uh, she'll pour the wines. I'll come back and magically I'll have the wines in front of me. She has instructions to, she took off all the foils. I won't see behind the labels. And also she's going to Coravin, which is like a wine saving device. She's gonna Coravin the nice wines so that I don't have to drink six bottles of wine this evening. I can save them. So I'm gonna go off camera and then we'll go from there. Okay, so she poured the wines, two sparkling wines. One of these is a $10 bottle and the other one is a $50 bottle. So we're gonna get more expensive with the expensive wines as we go on. But for now, $10 versus $50. All right, I guess I might as well start on the left. Okay, so this is a ripe, ripe wine. I get a lot, a lot of stone fruit, like really ripe peaches. On the palate, a lot more minerality. White chocolate, which is kind of cool. And a fairly long finish, which is another thing I'm looking for when I'm looking for a more expensive wine, is how long after I finish it, am I still tasting it? I'm tasting it for a while. So, and without trying the other one, this to me might be the more expensive one, but let's try the other one. I, I might get fooled on this one because there's only a $40 price difference. I would hope at the next levels I could pick it out, but I might get fooled on this one. Okay, so this is a much more leaner style. I got like really generous stone fruit with this. Ripeness too is sometimes an indication of quality depending on where you're at. Whereas this is a little bit leaner, maybe a bit more mineral driven. The bubble quality is about the same. That's a good sign. So the fact that this is riper, the fact that this, the bubble quality is not the same, the fact that I got a longer finish, 
I think they say like always go with your gut when you're tasting usually. I'm gonna say that this one is the more expensive wine and this one is the less expensive wine. Something wrong with more expensive here, less expenses here. Let's see if I got fooled or if I got it right. Okay, so I kept my eyes shut just in case I see the top of the bottle or the back of the bottle or something. So here we go. All right, I'll start with the cheaper one, I guess. I'll see if it's, well, I guess I don't know. Yeah, I'll start with the one I said was cheaper. Oh, this is definitely not the cheaper one. I definitely got fooled because this is champagne. So if this is champagne, this is not champagne. This is cava. All right, so I got fooled. Now that makes a little bit of sense to me because they're both champagne method wines and champagne is one of those regions where you are, you're paying so much for the place. Remember we talked about like place is, is so important, like reputation of a place. Well, champagne is like the ultimate, like you're paying for reputation. Bottles of wine in the champagne method from champagne start at like 40, 50 bucks, which is you know about what this is. Whereas cava, is a really, really good value. I always send people to Cava if they're like looking for really good value sparkling wine, still done in the champagne method, um, really high quality stuff for, I mean, uh, this is around $10. That was the guidelines I gave you. So that is really cool. And I guess I could be mad that I got it wrong, but I'm more just excited about the fact that the cheaper wine performs just as well as the, as the expensive wine. So there we go, wine number one. For what? Fooling you. Fooling, yeah, you fooled me. You fooled me. It's funny, because smelling it again after you know what it is, your mind definitely plays tricks on you. Like, when I smell it now, the minerality is so pronounced, and that should have been, that's not really an expensive or cheap thing, like, but champagne has this minerality that's just so distinct. If I knew I was tasting champagne versus cava, then maybe what I would have found it, or champagne versus like a riper wine, because the minerality of this is super pronounced and that's like a champagne hallmark. It's got this chalky minerality. But both, both good wines, I'm satisfied. I would drink either of these wines, no problem. All right, before we do our next tasting, let's talk about the second factor that affects the price and that's the quality. Um, the quality, I know I said isn't everything, but it is a lot. So the quality of the grapes has to do with the place they come from. As we mentioned, some places are more expensive. A lot of times those places have the reputation because they have really good weather and what we call terroir, really good climate. Um, but also other things like what we call the yields. So when you go to a vine, the more grapes per vine, the less concentrated the flavor is gonna be. So in a good wine, one they know is gonna be a little more expensive, they'll chop off some of the grapes and concentrate the ones that are left over. But obviously that means you're getting less grapes per vine, so it's gonna be more expensive. Um, how much time you spend in the harvest, so time both leading up to the harvest where you're pruning, taking care of the land, and then during the harvest, how much time are you spending, are you using machines to harvest or using by hand? You know, if you use a machine, they're just gonna get all the grapes. They don't care, it'll take everything. But if you harvest by hand, which costs more money, you can go and you can get every bunch at the peak of ripeness and leave the ones a little bit longer that aren't ready and then come back for them. So that's a big portion of it. The next thing is the quality of the oak. So if they're using oak at all, it's gonna be more expensive. And then oak barrels can be cheap or they can be thousands of dollars per barrel. And so if they're using oak in your wine, it tends to up the price as well. And then the last part is aging. So if they're aging the wine, some places you have to age the wine by law, other places and producers will age their wine just because they want to before they give it to you. Um, or sometimes you go to a retailer or a restaurant and they have some old wines on the list, right? Well, you have to pay for that because they're sitting on inventory that is just not making any money. So if a wine is older, it tends to be more expensive as well. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to the second blind tasting. Uh, I'm not gonna see him. My wife's gonna pour when I'm off camera here and then I'll come back in the room and we'll do our blind tasting. All right, I've got my wines in front of me. One of these is a $10 bottle and one of these is a $75 bottle. So hopefully I'll be able to see the difference a little more, but you never know, I missed the first one. They're both Chardonnays. I did tell her uh, to make, get two Chardonnays. I just thought it'd be a good comparison. So they're the same grape, different, I don't know, levels, places. I don't know, I don't know the rest. Um, so let's start on the left again. Whoo, that's a lot of butter. That's a lot of butter and a lot of oak. Toasty, creamy, popcorn. 
Mmm. Really rich, really full bodied. So remember I was saying a little bit, ooh, and long finish. So finish obviously I'm looking for, oaky I know is expensive, uh, ripeness in grapes. These are ripe grapes. This is not, like the wine isn't tart. The wine is very rich, uh, it coats the mouth. I would be shocked if that's not the more expensive. I mean, I haven't tried this one, but I would be shocked if that's not the more expensive one. Oh, that's a, that's a decent wine too. And that has oak and butter too. <laughs> is this gonna be another one that's really hard to tell? I mean, that is not a bad wine. I'm very shocked for a $10 wine that is not a bad wine if, I, if that's what I think it is. Wow. Um, again, this is, this is actually much more challenging than I thought it was gonna be. This finish is a bit quicker. I feel like the nose is not very, the nose almost tastes like there's some artificial oak on there or like not quite like really good quality oak. The grapes are a bit tartar. This is good though. I like this one more. I'm going with this one as the more expensive one based on the fact that the finish is really, really long. There's a lot of oak and butter, which in Chardonnay, unless they're doing it the fake way and they've really fooled me, is expensive if they're doing it the right way. And I just like the nose better and I like this wine better. So I'm going with this one. You locking it in? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, you're smiling though, so now I'm worried. But yeah, I gotta. I can't change it now because you smiled. All right, bring them out. I close my eyes. All right. Let's see the expensive one. Yeah. So I was right. So this is the expensive one, and this is the cheap one. But so these are both Burgundy. So they're both the same place. Um, so I made a tough one. Those same grape. Same place. This is really good for $10 Burgundy. Here's what this wine is. This is Carillon, which is a really good producer. Uh, Francois Carillon. Poulini Montrachet. It's a very specific place in Burgundy, known for that richer style. So when we said, okay, quality of grapes. So this means wine from Burgundy. It's Bourgogne. And that means they can get the grapes from anywhere in Burgundy. Uh, they probably are doing higher yields, just like we talked about. Probably not spending as much time in harvest. Whereas when you get to what we call the village level, which is Poulini Montrachet, is a village in Burgundy. Much more specific rules as to the yields. They literally have rules that say you can't harvest too many grapes per vine. The place is very specific. There's more time in harvest. Um, like I said, oak quality. I just got that artificial oak kind of character from this where I got like really good high quality oak from this. It was closer than I thought, but this is this is the winner and I love this wine. I wish you could, uh, I wish you could taste it. Oh yeah. All right, so the third and final reason I would say you would have an expensive wine versus a not so expensive wine is the packaging and the marketing. So the bottle cost, the how thick the bottle is, how fancy the label is, how nice your cork is, all that kind of comes into play. And usually they'll spend more money on the packaging on expensive wines, but not always. Sometimes cheap wines will make really expensive bottles to try and artificially boost their price, right? Oh, it looks fancy, it must be fancy. Uh, the other part is, are you buying from a big known brand? Like going back to that Apple analogy, right? Is it a brand that everybody wants and maybe has some cachet around it? or is it a lesser known brand? And then the last thing is that, is it coming from a big winery or is it coming from a small one? So if it's coming from a small boutique one, like all things boutique, it's probably gonna be a bit more expensive if there's only like limited allocation of it. Whereas if it's a big conglomerate, one, like they make a lot of wine so they don't need to sell it for as much. And two, they can leverage economies of scale. Either they personally make a bunch of wine or they're part of a group of wineries that, you know, a conglomerate and they make a bunch of wine so they can wrap together all their marketing and packaging and all of that stuff and produce a cheaper product. So that's kind of the last factor is, is marketing and packaging. Uh, that being said, I'm gonna go off. We're gonna do the last wine. So Lisa's gonna get ready. I'll be right back. All right, on the last wine, Here's the instructions I gave. Uh, I know they're both Cabernets, but Cabernet $10 versus $100. So there should be a really distinct difference between these two wines if, you know, both wineries have done their job right. 
There's nothing wrong with $10 wine. I have a lot of $10 wines I enjoy, but hopefully I'll be able to know pretty easily which one is which. Already going in from the color, one looks a lot more deep and ripe than the other. I mean, they're completely different colors. This is like a ruby. It's a bit transparent. This is almost like a garnet. It's much more deep. You can see rim variation. That's a kind of an advanced thing, but essentially the color on the wine is different than the color on the rim. That leads to me for aging or oxygen. So that's probably like some oak treatment. So already like just looking at them, I'm kind of leaning towards this one being my more expensive one, but let's try them. So let's try the left one. Okay, not really getting a lot from the nose. Now I'm getting a little like cherry fruit, which knowing that it's Cabernet, uh, you actually kind of hope, I mean, I, I'll have some Cabernets with some, some cherry fruit flavor, but you kind of want riper flavors from your Cabernet. I want darker flavors, I want blackberry. Ooh, a lot of tannin, surprisingly. Um, tannin kind of drying my mouth out. It's a bit thin. Uh, it's, it's fine. It tastes like wine. It's not horrific wine, but if this is the expensive one, I would be very shocked. I'm spitting, by the way, so I can stay sharp. That's why I know it's a little gross, but when you drink a bunch of wine in a row, you want to, I want to stay sharp. I can't get two out of three wrong. I have to at least get two of them right. So, wow. A lot of oak. Wow. I mean, there's no question. This is the more, I, I, there's no way. I will, I will retire as a sommelier if this is not the more expensive wine. There's just not even a, a comparison. Oh my gosh. The flavor is so dense. It's rich. The oak is great. The fruit character is cassis. It's got these beautiful smoky characteristics to it from, from the oak. There's tobacco, there's leather. This one is, you know, it's fine, but it, there's not much going on at all. This is an amazing wine. It is rich, it is balanced, it's got oak character, it's got fruit character, it's really, really lengthy, it's complex, I'm still getting new things. Sure? Yeah. Dude, I, what, did I not sound sure? <laughs> sure I'm sure, but you could really embarrass me right now. That's a big statement that you yeah. retire. You could really uh, embarrass me right now if this is the wrong wine. All right, so let's reveal it. So I called the left as the cheaper wine. You want to reveal the expensive wine or the cheaper wine? Well, it doesn't matter because I can see already the taller bottle. Um, so yeah, uh, I was right, thank God. Like I said, if I, I would have some serious soul searching to do if I didn't call it. This is Dom Melchior. So this is a very, very famous Chilean producer. So or I told Lisa, I said, pick a wine that has some, some cachet around it so it would relate to what we were talking about. Um, this is a very famous producer. The label is nice, pretty. Uh, the bottle is tall. You can see that, spend a little more money on their bottle. Um, you can see the divot on the bottom here called the punt is uh, a little deeper. Whereas this is like, this is your generic, what we call a Bordeaux bottle. Very, very generic bottle, kind of generic label. They put the awards on there, which is kind of uh, usually a thing that they do in maybe less expensive wines to try and stand out. Whereas like, this guy doesn't need to stand out because if you know this wine, you know this producer. Um, it's just one of the best out there. All right, let's talk about our results, what we learned, and then I, I owe you talking about the sweet spot of price point for wine. So from a results perspective, none of those wines are terrible wines. The $10 versus, you know, the 75 versus the 50 versus 100. Obviously, you'd hope the expensive wines would be good. None of the $10 wines were terrible. I told you I got fooled on one of them. So I'm big on finding value in wines. There's lots of places to find value, whether you go to an under-recognized region, an under-recognized producer, new grapes, grapes that are maybe a little more obscure. There's lots of good ways to find value in wine. And that being said, I did see a difference, especially as we got more and more expensive, but not every wine is supposed to be a $100 wine. There's plenty of wines I want to be just $10, $15 wines. I don't have to think about, I'm opening at a party, it's a Tuesday night, whatever it is. So that's kind of the, the takeaway I hope you get from that is, you know, there's, there's plenty of good wines out there at all different price points. Speaking of price points, I do think there is a sweet spot for wine prices. As long as you're not going for a very famous region, remember I said, like Champagne starts at 40 bucks or 50 bucks. Uh, Napa Valley Cabernet will start at $40, $50.
If you're not going for a very famous producer or a very famous region, then you can get great wines in the $15 to $30 range. And I believe you can find good representations of almost every grape and every place on the planet in the $15 to $30 range. It's kind of my, my sweet spot. Uh, I'll do a whole nother video about how I think it's important to shop at small stores, but that also helps you get more value for your wine rather than going to big box stores or grocery stores. If you guys enjoyed this video, just give it a thumbs up. And if you wanna learn more about wine and wine technique and etiquette, I have a video coming out called How to Taste Wine Like an Expert that'll give you some tips how to taste wine a little better. Make sure to subscribe and turn on the little bell for notifications because I post videos every Friday challenges, unique wine content, cooking tutorials, pairings, and more. So yeah, I'll see you soon. Until next wine.